Joshua, as a computational biologist who has dealt with genealogical and genetic ancestry, what can you say about race, a controversial topic, in terms of whether it's a natural kind, whether it's a self-imposed uh, uh, structure on humanity that has caused a lot of problems, uh, the whole issue of, of, of human nature and racial distinctions or indistinctions? That's a good question. Race is a, a really complicated and controversial topic, but this is one of those places where biology might actually have some really helpful information for us to help navigate this. Um, now, before I do that, it's important to remember that uh, this, this issue of multivalence, words mean really different things. And when we talk about race, we really have to uh, recognize that it's a multivalent term too. Um, there's different meanings of the term race. And uh, when you ask questions like, is race real? Depending on what you mean by race, uh, it can be real or not. And, and that's important, so. So give specifics, I mean, give an example where a, ra a definition of race is real and one where it's not real. Yeah, so an example of uh, a way that we know now, and this is the helpful part, that it's not real, is if we think about it as like a deep, intrinsic biological uh, uh, concept that's like sharply defined in nature, and it's also, uh, it tells us a great deal about a person's, um, you, know, uh, you know, capacities intelligence-wise and where they fit into society. And this is, not, it's important to remember that this is also the dominant way that people understood race in the past. That type of uh, understanding of race we know is just not true. It doesn't actually work biologically. And, and that's a bit of a surprise, actually, because that's not how it really works for other species. <laughs> other species really do seem to have these divisions. I can explain in chimpanzees, too, where you can see this. Like, um, in, in, for chimpanzees, they're, they're kind of confined to this area in Africa, but they're spread out in four or five different regions there that are, that are pretty, pretty close to one another. If you look at them genetically, you can see that there are probably like maybe four to five races of, of, of chimpanzees. And if you throw bonobos in there, which are, look pretty similar, you know, there's maybe one more. And, and there's very big differences too between these different groups. Uh, bonobos is our great example. They, they kind of grow up on one side of a river, never really cross over the side. Not, they're certainly not interbreeding with chimpanzees enough to, uh, to kind of share the same evolutionary fate. And they're, they're a lot more friendlier. There's abundant food. They're not having to face off the lions all the time. On the mm -hmm. other side of the river, you have chimpanzees, which end up being a lot more aggressive and, and, uh, and dangerous sorts of animals because there's a lot more food scarcity and there's more lions they have to deal with. So th that's an example where uh, even though they're very, very similar to one another, there ends up being very deep genetic differences built into it. And that tends to be the, the, the pattern in biological species. That's just not what happened. With humans. When we look at humans, we can see that we're, uh, you know, tightly connected across the globe. <laughs> we're really a common family genealogically, and we share the common, a common fate genetically as well. Uh, that the differences that we see end up being um, really skin deep. There might be some biological, so here's an example of a biological understanding of race that has a little bit more legitimacy to it. If we understand race in a thin way, not this biologically thick determinative way, but as a loose, messy reference to different, um, fairly recent continental ancestry, meaning like, were you from Africa mm -hmm. or Asia or the United States or the Americas, then there is some legitimacy to it. Um, but it doesn't tell us nearly as much as our insects tell us it, it would. Mm. Well, there are differences in terms of, um, for example, in healthcare, how different uh, diseases or different pharmaceuticals might affect different races differently. In fact, there is uh, challenges that uh, for certain uh, racial groups that there's been less attention paid to them and therefore some pharmaceutical procedures m might have been beneficial to them, but they haven't been studied because uh, nobody paid attention to it. So that's a, a, a potential distinction that different groups might have. Now that might have to do with environmental factors or whatever, but they, th that's a practical consideration that if you consider r race as a, uh, as a category, you might be able to improve the healthcare. Yeah, so that's a great example of where there's a, some sort of reality to race and we can parse out what that is. First of all, race as a social category is a real thing. Oh yeah, but yeah. But and, um, that, and those socioeconomic factors are, have a huge impact on things like healthcare. 
And so even though it doesn't work in this biologically tight definition, it still becomes really valuable to think about things that way. That's one legitimate way. The other way it becomes important is that the, these loose definitions of race sometimes have a weak correlation with particular genetic or biological determinants. Mm. And so if you only study, for example, white people, you're going to be focusing on a particular genetic background right. that, um, that will have usually, and almost every, vari almost every variant we see, it's, you'll see it in every single race. Right. So it's not cleanly divided that way, but it just won't be a common variant in, among Well, I mean, in, in, in my case, uh, descended from Ashkenazi Jews, we have a tendency for certain kinds of diseases that are not as much in the general population. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's good to be aware of that in order to protect against it or, or to have an advanced warning. Yeah, and, you know, that's a great example. So among Ashkenazi Jews, there's a certain proclivities for Tay-Sachs disease. Right. But um, what genetics is really enabling us to do is just talk about that with higher precision. That's no longer at the group level, but now talking about who actually has that particular Indeed. genetic change. Right. And who doesn't? So if you don't actually have that that mutation, yeah. then you don't have to live as a Ashkenazi zoo in that sense, <laughs> in, in a good way, right? Yeah, right? But if you do, and you're not Ashkenazi zoo, you still, have, change, to you still have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's an example of how there's not a perfect correspondence, right, right. and and so you can see that happening, um, you know, really across you know every area of medicine where there's going to be particular variants that might be higher represented mm. in particular places, but they're not going to be common to everyone who's black or Asian or, or however you want to say it. Um, and so if we can think about them kind of as, as kind of like maybe a, a loose bags where you might see different types of diversity, then actually race can be a legitimate way to think about it. If we want to think about it as um, a group of people we need to treat identically the same, even though they have very different genetics, that becomes a problem. Yeah, yeah, so, that's a, so it's, a, it's a very sophisticated approach to it in which we need to have in order to in order to both treat people equally and fairly on a social basis, but also on a particular basis have maybe greater screening, like in my case for Tay-Sachs or for somebody else with sickle cell anemia, whatever it happens to be, because of the, of the prevalence, of the statistical prevalence w within their population. Yeah, so it ends up being this paradox again, where I think there is a thin reality, thin yeah. biological reality to race in the way how most people are meaning it nowadays, but, um, the older ways that people have understood race is telling you these intrinsic differences that are sharp between, you know, this fairly generalized groups of just like, you know, five to six races across the globe. That, that ends up being really a myth. And, yeah. and, and it's important to keep that in mind as we're really trying to create healthcare and science and understanding of the world. That's for all sure. people, not just some of us. Sure. Is, is there any um, lessons we can take from that in understanding the relationship between humans and Neanderthals or Desnovians? Yeah. So if Neanderthals lived to today, it would probably be legitimate to consider them a different race of humans. <laughs> if Denisovans did, um, you know, they are, you know, distinct. And it seems like they had different capacities. There's some pretty good evidence coming out, uh, both from, you know, computational analysis and even in vitro as we kind of make these mini brains and test tubes mm. or in Petri dishes. That suggests that, you know, the, the mental capacities mm. of Neanderthals might have been quite different than Homo sapiens. So in that sense, if Neanderthals had lived today, maybe those old ideas of race would be, would be somewhat <laughs> legitimate. And uh, you know, there was one, uh, there was one Neanderthal re researcher that, that kind of commented, and I think, I think it was very, very true about, about, about this. He was saying that you know, it would be kind of amazing if one day we found that there was like some little island somewhere where Neanderthals <laughs> survived to today, right? To be able to actually study them and talk to them and meet them. But on the other hand, that'd be like a horrific thing, <laughs> given our history with this sort of stuff. I mean. Uh, we, we probably wouldn't treat them as well as, as we should. Mm. And so, you know, we can certainly imagine a world, and certainly when you look into the distant past, we see this lavish diversity of different types of humans in the past. Um, so, you know, is that necessarily racist? No, because, you know, we could treat each other well across mm. those differences. We just know that's not our history. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, I'm really thankful that the world we find, as we find it, has a, a large number of humans, but they're all the same type of human.